Hi everyone and welcome to the first Open Core Told Hour of 2022. My name is Leila Bumbra and I am the Programme Manager for the Research Forum here at the Courtauld. And I want to start by saying as always the biggest thank you to Bloomberg Philanthropies for their generous support of our digital initiatives, especially tonight's event. And for this special event we are delighted to be pairing up with artist Cecily Brown for an in conversation that spans the processes of Cecily's craft to the end result. And what we are going to be focusing on is Cecily's commission at the Courtauld. And this event will be really to allow those unable to see the work in person um, and give you all a chance to experience it in its glory. So Cecily was born in London, as many of you will probably know, and she now lives and works in New York. And before moving to the US, Cecily studied at the Slade School of Art, where she received a BA in Fine Arts. And there's not really enough time in my short introduction to list all of Cecily's artistic achievements, but to give you a flavour, her solo exhibitions have reached Lenin Park, Thomas Dane Gallery, the Metropolitan Opera House, the Whitworth Art Gallery, and many, many more. And she's also included in public collections such as the Guggenheim Museum in New York, Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, and the Tate in London. So Cecily's works are steeped in the art historical, often referencing the masterpieces and the greats, and some of which are in our collection. And Cecily is well known for her colossal, all-encompassing large-scale works that portray the medium in a continual state of flux. And anyone who has had the pleasure of seeing Cecily's work in the flesh will know that her work constantly blurs the lines between figuration and abstraction. And her art is alive with what can only be described as erotic energy. And this is translated onto the canvas through her expressive application of materials and vivid colour palette. So Cecily's work, which we're going to talk about in detail, unmoored from her reflection, is perfectly placed now in the transformed Portold Gallery. And witnessing this work is really fantastic. And it's almost like traversing all the years of art history. And it's even more <laughs> pertinent when you walk up the stairs and you can see the drips of paint underneath the canvas. And um, so we're so pleased to have Cecily with us this evening because this work really connects the contemporary and historic and encapsulates why art and art history is still relevant in 2022. So before we kick off, um, this event will be made up mainly of the conversation between Cecily and Barney. And then I will come back on for about 10 to 15 minutes, hopefully, to pose the pre-submitted questions by our students and also to take your questions. So you can get those to me throughout the hour via the chat and you can also get in touch with us on social media. We are on at Courtauld Rise and please do also use the hashtag Open Courtauld Hour. So I am now absolutely delighted to introduce and pass over to my wonderful colleague, Barnaby Wright, who is Deputy Head of the Courtauld Gallery and Daniel Katz, curator of 20th Century Art. And he's been working extremely closely with Cecily on this commission and is an expert on all things the Courtauld, our collection and the building. So I will pass over to Barney to introduce this work in situ a little bit more. Leila, thank you very much indeed. And, and welcome everybody this evening. It's fantastic to be joined by so many uh, people this evening. Some of you I'm sure will have had the chance to uh, see the uh, newly renovated and reopened Courtauld, um, and therefore to have seen uh, Cecily's amazing large-scale work unmoored uh, from her reflection um, on the uh, as part of the uh, one's experience of the gallery. But I thought before um, Cecily and I start our conversation, we um, I might just show you, share with you a few images of the work to sort of set the scene. And particularly for uh, those of you that uh, haven't yet been able to get to London to see uh, the picture in, in situ. And I thought I'd give just a little bit of context just for uh, four or five minutes before uh, I uh, ask Cecily to join me uh, to talk about the work in, in much more detail. So here it is. This is one of my uh, favourite photographs of it, I think. It's been widely shared and used uh, in the media and online at around the time of our reopening in uh, in November of last year, this fantastic view through the columns uh, and across to, uh, to the painting itself. Um, the picture uh, is positioned 
at the uh, on the top floor of, uh, of the Courtauld Gallery in Somerset House uh, on uh, the curved wall of its famous 18th century staircase that winds its way up the full height of the building and culminates in the major gallery spaces on the top floor, where in the uh, refurbished and redisplayed Courtauld, our um, Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings hang. And in fact, this photograph is taken from what's known as the ante room, which is where some of the great pictures of uh, that part of the collection um, are displayed, including works by uh, Manet and Degas and Gauguin and many others. Uh, who are of great relevance to Cecily uh, herself and to her work. And I'm sure we'll talk a bit about this, the way that some of those uh, artists and pictures are woven into this painting. But let me just take a few steps back to say something about the space itself, the space that the painting occupies. So here's a different view from uh, the floor below looking up. Um, and in a sense, this picture really describes uh, the challenge that we asked Cecily to take on when we invited her to produce a picture for this, uh, for this space. Uh, invited her to produce a painting uh, for this curved framed panel, uh, which is something like six meters uh, span and just under two meters um, high. And you'll see that the space is actually uh, a frame created by uh, a plaster molding. So it's a sort of picture frame in plaster. And indeed, it was originally designed to house a large painting, which was part of the original decorations of the building when it opened to the public in 1780 as the first home of the Royal Academy of Art. And the work that occupied that space originally is now lost, possibly destroyed, most likely destroyed, and probably it, that happened at some point in the first half of the 19th century. And so in a sense, this space uh, has been crying out for uh, a picture to fill it ever since. And Cecily's work here is is, to my knowledge, the first to, to fill this space in, uh, in perhaps 200 years. The well-known uh, print, satirical print by, uh, by Rowlandson on the right of the screen from about 1811 is to my knowledge, the only representation of uh, the original painting in uh, that space. And you see it at the top of the stairs here where there's some uh, very unruly Royal Academy visitors tumbling down the stairs. This is Rowlandson trying to really puncture all the lofty ideals of the Royal Academy, women with their skirts flying and uh, very lechy men uh, staring at them. Um, but in fact, the what you see in that curve, which is a sort of sexy looking Venus cartoon on a on a chariot kind of pulled by naked nymphs, I guess, that is in fact Rowlandson's invention entirely and was designed uh, itself to send up the original picture, which was there. And we do know that that picture was a uh, large scale freeze like picture by the Royal Academician Cipriani um, depicting uh, not Venus, but in fact Minerva, goddess of wisdom, uh, Minerva visiting the muses on Mount, Mount Parnassus. We know this well because it's recorded in, um, in a guide, in uh, Beretti's Guide to the Royal Academy, uh, which was published when the Royal Academy uh, opened at Somerset House, and he describes it in some detail here. And although the picture's lost, it might have looked something like the uh, print, which is by Cipriani, of exactly the same subject from the same uh, years that's uh, in the British Museum. So it may have looked something uh, like this. So all of this, that is to say the Courtauld's collection, and here represented by a picture that I know means a lot to Cecily, which is Manet's, the Courtauld's version of Manet's Déjeuner sur l'herbe. The space itself, this extraordinary uh, architectural space, and that earlier Royal Academy history, all of this was in a sense um, part of, um, part of uh, 
part of the, the proposition that we put to Cecily um, and allowed her to consider, invited her to consider in making uh, this extraordinary picture. And here it is a bit closer up uh, in the curved space. Um, and her response was to produce this picture unmoored from uh, her reflection. And she worked on the picture in her New York studio during the first part of uh, 2021. Um, and it was installed at the Courtauld in October last year and then uh, opened in November when the uh, gallery reopened. And it comprises, you can see, I think, uh, here, of three equally scaled canvases that were stretched onto curved supports. And then the three parts abutted to present a single curved work in the space. And I thought just briefly, um, we would just pause on uh, those three panels just to have them in your mind. So this, the central panel, uh, really dominated by these uh, remarkable uh, large full length male uh, nudes. The uh, left hand side, uh, which uh, has this great sort of rush of painterly energy with figures emerging throughout the, uh, throughout the sort of field of paint. Um, uh, but with a very sort of prominent uh, palette uh, spiked on a thumb in the centre here. And then on the uh, right hand side, uh, this uh, great sort of flowing of, uh, of forms and paint and uh, figures and faces emerging and receding everywhere you uh, look. And uh, this uh, sort of basket, uh, it seems, on the right hand side. And uh, I think you can make out there a, a standing figure on the on the left. So I hope that just um, gives you a little uh, sense of the work itself and in the space. And I'm now going to stop sharing. We can come back to this if we need to. Uh, but I'm going to ask Cecily perhaps to join me by unmuting and uh, putting on her video. There she is. Cecily, hi, very nice to see you. Can you, Hi. can you hear me all right, Cecily? You may be muted yourself, I think. There. Perfect. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. Very, very many thanks for joining us this evening. I guess it's sort of mid-afternoon in New York, is that right? Yeah, very just good gone one. three. Uh, it's really, uh, it's really great that you've uh, agreed to join us here. And I should say that many of our students have submitted some questions, which I'm going to weave into the conversation we're going to have, as well as us, you taking some questions, I hope, at the end. Um, and if you want me to just pull up the picture again at any point, just, just say so. Um, but I wanted to start, really. I have my version here. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, although my colours look much duller than yours. <laughs> in reality, it's incredible. Yeah, it was incredible to see the difference in reality when we uh, when we installed it. So vibrant. Thank you. Look, I wanted to start, Cecily, by really asking you what it what were your first thoughts when we approached you with uh, with with this idea and this and this space? You certainly seem to respond enthusiastically but I wonder I mean was it daunting was it scary as a prospect it's quite an unusual thing to be presented with yeah I mean it was very scary I mean I was it's very intimidating the idea of hanging with you know a lot of you know some such amazing paintings um as you know I just fin just done that show at Blenheim Palace um and the year before that had made these two enormous paintings that had hung at the Metropolitan Opera. Um, so I kind of had, I think if those two things hadn't have happened, I probably would have said, oh, I'd love to, thank you so much, but there's no way I can make something specific for a specific space. But because in the last couple of years, that had really actually been an exciting way for me to work, um, I thought, um, well, yeah, it sounds amazing. Um, I mean, it's just obviously such an amazing opportunity and, um, but of course intimidating, but I just felt like also very challenging and exciting. Um, and as you remember, um, at the time I was sort of obsessing about Manet, um, always pronounce it wrong. Here they say Manet, 
which also isn't the right French way, but Manet, as we always say in English. So I um, had been working from Manet, um, I think around the time you called. And as you know, and also Monk, and I had a lot of things I was working on in the studio that almost seemed that um, would, my mind was in the right place to be thinking about sort of, I mean, obviously the collection's huge, but particularly about sort of French painting and sort of, you know, late 19th century. Um, so when you said that the painting would hang sort of in juxtaposition with people like Degas, Manet and the others, um, yeah, I thought, yeah, I'd love to do it. Um, because I think the, um, I, I'm not sure I knew at the time we approached you that actually you were working not just on those artists who of course we know have been part of your world since you were a student and probably probably earlier but also that you were specifically thinking about Manet's Dejeuner at that that point so that was just a great coincidence that uh, that that should come to pass because that was you were working from it at that point yourself yeah and um in fact there's a show coming up that in LA um that where the Dejeuner sur Lab paintings, basically, blah, 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 sorry. Um, yeah, I'd been looking at Dejeuner sur Lab. And so when I first started talking to you and, um, you know, you sent me um, links to the collection, because of course I knew the collection quite well as a student at the Slade, but I've been here over 25 years. And then of course, like everyone else barely traveled. So anyway, not seen the collection in person for years, but then, to be reminded that the Dejeuner Love was there was another um, thing that really made me jump at the chance. Um, yeah, I came, came to it in a sort of roundabout way because I'd been working on still lives, um, which was sort of genre that I'd never really used before the last couple of years. But um, off and on, sort of starting in 2019, I'd been um, working from Franz Snyder's, the Dutch, um, 16th century, 17th, 17th century, uh, still life, among other things, still life painter. Um, and I'd always thought that the still life sort of parts of Dejeuner sur Lab were one of the most extraordinary still lives in any painting. Um, and obviously they're not really the thing one really thinks about when you think about Dejeuner sur Lab, but, um, and I'd started just copying it around the time, just before you called, I think. Um, and actually found the whole still life section, one of the most difficult pieces of painting I've ever attempted to copy. So I was sort of obsessing about that, um, which would make you think that I might make a painting directly in response to that painting for you guys, or, you know, with more obvious Manet in it, but I didn't really want to do that. In fact, I have my notes here from our very first meeting and the first, th it's got the first few things I wrote down after talking to you. And um, they include mirrors, gardens, beaches, bathrooms, plumbing, um, bedrooms and dressing tables. But I think beaches um, were one of the first things that came to mind. And in the end that my figures are, if they're anywhere specific, it's probably, it's a sort of beach scene. And, um, you know, that relates to people like Eugene Boudin, who I absolutely love. And you have an incredible beach by Boudin. Mm. Um, and, you know, I just started looking more closely at other people, apart from Manet of that era, and um, realized how much the paintings of beaches have meant to me. And Degas, too, there's an incredible Degas painting of a beach that I've always sort of thought about a lot. It's actually a National Gallery, but, um, mm. you know, I think it was natural then for me to start looking at what was in the collection, but also not hone in to closely on any particular work because, because of the way I've always worked, which most people know, but if they don't, you know, I often draw from other people's, I often copy other people's art, um, but also, you know, have reproductions lying around on the floor, like thousands of painters do, but, you know, work indirectly from an awful lot of um, different painters. Um, so I, I basically printed out a bunch of things that I liked from the collection and sort of just had them strewn around and, you know, um, sort of just started absorbing it all before I started work. So you were in this sort of, maybe broadly speaking, this sort of impressionist place in your head and with images around and, and so on. 
how did you get how did you sort of start you knew it had this odd scale i mean huge very long but quite not very tall and on a curve and did you start making drawings and sketching it out that way i think you worked on another canvas at some early point in the process yeah i mean once i started thinking about it i was really antsy to get started i really couldn't wait because i started sort of being flooded with potential images I could use, which is the other real reason I said yes. I think I said, you know, well, let me think about it. And immediately I could sort of start picturing what it could kind of look like. But, you know, I never really try and picture a finished painting, but I could just feel straight away that there was a lot um, of meat there and subject content. Um, but so as you, we, we had to wait for the canvases to arrive because they're so specific, because they were going to hang on a curve. But in fact, they had to be stretched flat for me to be able to work on here. Um, so I didn't really make drawings. Um, I don't usually make studies for paintings. Um, and I don't know, I don't really like the translation that occurs between a drawing and a painting. It doesn't often really make much sense to me. I'll often make drawings during the course of making a painting. Um, but so I did, I, I just used three small canvases that I had in a studio and put them side by side and did a sort of mini um, I guess study for, just to kind of get some of my ideas out. I didn't want it all to be, I didn't want to be bored of my ideas by the time the canvas came. So I knew I just wanted to kind of get started and sort of start figuring out the palette and not, not anything I, that I ended up hewing closely too much, but just to start ordering things in my head a bit. And so as is typical, I didn't actually refer to the study, you know, while I was working on the big one. Can you it's hear so that noise in the background? Because I can try and make it stop if it's... Not particularly. I think okay, let fine. me know. There's some construction outside, which I can't control, but some things no, no, I, can, I, I can... Okay. I think no need to have a row with the builders. It's <laughs> fine. We can't, uh, we can't hear it. Um, but so did some of those sort of major elements of the picture, I mean, I think when you first look at the picture, it's those male nudes that really strike you were they there early on or in your mind or on canvas or did they emerge later um well they weren't there at all in the so-called study um but i think i knew that i needed something really central um to sort of really pin down the action and i'm always kind of struggling to be more figurative and make things clearer um and some of the paintings in the studio had been going that way um so yeah i think but i'm not actually sure how quickly they came when i started the 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 real thing um it actually relates quite a lot to an another really big sort of freeze like painting that i'd done a few years before that has two quite central female figures um which i wasn't really aware of when i started but once i started working on it i realized this is almost like a system, you know, the two figures in the center really do anchor, um, anchor the action. And then I think the nature of having something freeze-like, you know, I knew that I could really kind of exploit that and have things get sort of much looser as you sort of went away from the figures in a way. But I tried to treat it very much like I treat any painting. So I didn't want to get too uptight about it or too planned. Um, so, but it's true that once the figures came, they stayed, whereas yeah. often I might get rid of them, bring them back, move them around. But I was like, okay, that works. And I knew I didn't want it to be a super, very, very worked painting. I definitely wanted to keep some of the lightness um, of touch. And, um, you know, some of my paintings can get really, you know, gnarly, as they say here. <laughs> and I thought this, it was really important for me that this retained the sort of a light and the levity. Those figures themselves, I mean, they are quite, they're, they're taken in a sense based on a painting by Edvard Munch of male bathers. I think the, the principal version is in Helsinki and they're quite close to that picture. I mean, they're almost a quotation one might say, or, or certainly inspired by, oh, there they are, yes. And they and look I very photographic when you see this in black and white. Um, so yeah, very close. And had that been, that been a picture that had been close to you for a while, had it? Yeah, just the last few months, but I've been working for it a lot. But the subject of the male nude has been something I've tried to do off and on for many, many years. Um, so I'm kind of, I think recently I'm realizing 
it's more helpful to actually take something, you know, to, when I am fighting things sort of breaking down and getting too abstract, it's, it sounds so dumb, but it's actually just really helpful to take something existing and sort of force myself to hew to it more um, strictly. They are- And actually not, when I have, when I have a sort of outside thing to hold on to, uh, I think somehow I'm less critical of it when it, than when it's just a made up figure by me. And so I'm more likely to kind of hold on to it. Um, in the context of the painting and specifically it hanging where it does in the courtold with that prehistory that I was talking a little bit about in the presentation, those male nudes are extraordinary. I mean, they do something to our collection, which obviously has, as lots of collections of its type do, quite a lot of female nudes. One thinks quite a lot about that earlier context of female muses and nymphs and you know so on, um, that the Royal Academy had sort of strewn around in various forms. And it feels to some extent those figures like a sort of, yeah, is it a riposte? Is it a reply? Is it a speaking back to all of that? Was that in your in your mind? Is it in your mind now as you see it hanging in the space? Yeah, I mean, I, I knew I wasn't going to do female nudes. Um, I mean, there are fragmented female figures, but I definitely like the idea of putting some naked men in the courtyard with all the hundreds of naked women. Um, I mean, I told you this story about how the way I managed to not feel too intimidated by the idea of showing with all the all the boys was to actually imagine I just sort of pretended to myself that I was going to be in a group exhibition with them and just thinking of it as oh they're just my mates that we're going to go for drinks later and you know they're just my peers because if I'd been born at another time or they had it's quite possible that they would just have been I could have been at art school with them um, so I just tried to sort of think how would I, if I was in a salon with knowing that Edgar and Henri and Vincent were all gonna be in it, you know, the way you kind of keep your, your peers in mind in some way when you're working, like not to respond directly, but to sort of be thinking about how would this be in conversation? Um, but I didn't want it to be sort of in conversation with the past, but more, because to me, all those pictures are still so alive, obviously, you know, to sort of, you know have something that spoke to them um so very much in the present so yeah I really knew I wanted naked men in there and I I was happy with um how they are so um clearly figurative for me um but I did you know of course very aware as well of the um lack of female painters in the in the collection which again, as you say, it's a lot of it is down to it's um, the time that most of it was bought. And, but um, it definitely seemed not in a cheeky way, but just that I had no choice to, as a female painter, to, to paint a male nude. I think one of the things you do with those male nudes, I was trying to think why, I mean, I found them quite, I still do find them quite, yeah, sort of, they bring me up short when I look at them. And it's not that it's just that they're male nudes and one's unused to male nudes, because of course now that, that's not, not the case at all in, in uh, modern uh, and contemporary painting. But it's also because you, you sort of don't know quite why they're in the painting, quite what they're doing there. They sort of, you can't pin them down as a type or a trope, they are, yeah, they sort of have a sort of sense of being rather heroic and bold and sort of marching out of that dreamscape of painting. But at the same time, they're not that either. They have a certain vulnerability to them, I, I guess. Um, so I suppose in making them quite so figurative, maybe, in making them quite so precise, you did you feel you were running the risk of pinning them down and needing to avoid that? I mean, that sense of ambiguity that's in them, that was that important to you? Yeah, I mean, they certainly, there was some kind of push and pull where they sometimes they disappeared a bit more and sort of trying to keep them in the picture as it were. I mean, I kind of, by using suggestions of other figures just behind them and then the bather echoed in the right. So, I mean, it was a sort of tricky balance because one of my fears is always when certain things do get more figurative that I don't want it to feel like separate spaces and the worst of all, like a figure standing in front of an abstract painting. So that's the challenge is to kind of not integrate because I like the sort of disjunction of, you know, but to 
so that they occupy the same space in a way that makes sense, even if there are kind of contradictions and things. But the fact that it was a triptych and that the panels give this natural division, that was helpful. And again, I work with diptychs and triptychs and multi-panel things a lot. And I always like the way that the divide sort of lends itself to a sort of shift in the way you apply paint or, you know, how clear something is. I mean, there were things on both of the outside panels that were clearer at some point. And in a way, having the male figures so clear allows one to be a little more loosey-goosey in the, as you get further away. Um, and I, I've always played with this, the idea that, you know, if you have one clear figure, then the mind is more likely to see other figures mm -hmm. echoed. Whereas if they weren't there and everything was on the same level of semi-abstraction, um, you could m much more easily miss um, the limbs and faces and other body parts in the other panels. I was I mean, also conscious that it's a public space. You know, it's not a, just a uh, gallery where a few art world people are going to see it, but that being aware that I do think for the pub, that sounds patronizing, but I think figuration is more um, sort of democratic in a way and abstraction can sort of take us, it can see, be seen as sort of more, you know, airy, keep rhyming, airy fairy, now and be pamby, but you know what I mean, that yeah. the figuration sort of, for me, very much brings it back down to earth in a very literal way, which is why I'm really trying to steer myself that way more. And I think, I this. mean, what, what a lot of visitors are finding, and, and certainly uh, I do when I look at it, is that it is, and to underline for those who haven't seen it, although what appears sort of, let's call it abstract on the side panels, I mean, it's anything but, it's absolutely teeming with different sort of faces and figures. And you sort of can't believe that you missed some of them the first time you looked at it. And maybe it's only the fourth time that something else appears. It's, it's really rich and layered in that way. I, I wonder if you could just walk us through a little bit, some of those areas of the picture, those aspects that you were talking about were more prominent and then perhaps receded to give us yeah. a bit of a flavor of those themes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, on the right hand panel, bottom right, there's um, a basket that's pretty much a direct quote from the Dejeuner sur Lab, um, talking of that still life. And again, it's very much like it grounds the action to, to sort of have something more solid in a corner. Um, I mean, just in a formal way, it's almost like a, a full stop at the end of the painting. Um, and then going backwards that way, you know, there's certainly another male torso looks like sort of legs and, and belly and uh, genitals of a male, which doesn't really get completed. Um, leading over, I think the scale kind of gets bigger on the right hand panel, like suddenly things are closer to you. So it's almost like, I mean, there's definitely a sort of hallucinatory or even psychedelic aspect to some of my work that hasn't really been talked about much that you can, you you know, the, maybe you're in a sort of dream or drunk um, and things are sort of looming and going away, almost like a bit of an, they, there's a, can be a sort of nightmarish aspect, but that things are not where you think they are. And I think I play with that a lot because as you say, it's always teeming with figuration and fragmented figuration. Um, but one of the things that I think painting lends itself to so well to is, you know, the freedom to be able to shift the scale constantly and have some things that vary in your face and other things in the far distance, really just often just by using color, you know, just um, really simple things. So knowing that it was gonna be on that curve sort of more coming towards you, I did kind of wanna play with that idea that things are more looming. Um, and then you do go back up, you know, every painter knows and most art historians, you know, the blue and green are gonna take your eye further back. So I definitely wanted like those deep spaces and that sort of Mediterranean palette of the kind of blues and golds. And then as you go behind the men, I mean, there's a kind of self-portrait lurking behind them where, where I was adding and taking away these other figures, some of which are in the monk. Um, I thought, you know, I, my faces often end up looking a bit like me anyway. It was a sort of cartoonish me. It's, if you go up the sort of yellowish area would be, it's kind of, I don't know um, if you I'm can see my cursor, yeah. but it's this exactly. area here. And that I mean, almost cartoonish eye at the top um, that I just sort of couldn't resist, including of the idea of um, being in the court of myself. 
it's an interesting um, self-portrait if that's how we're we're to see it because it's sort of part of the picture but also rather aloof as well I mean you're sort of observing in a way are you well I don't think of it as aloof um you know I'm, I'm more like not quite sure I belong I think <laughs> um <laughs> is anyone gonna expose find me here and like you know um and then to the left of the figures and it's funny, at one point I started thinking they looked a lot like Bacon and Freud, which I also thought was quite funny. Um, what, the sort two of male two... views themselves. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. um, faces are so hard without sort of, to do a sort of generalized face where it doesn't start looking like a portrait. So that's one of the hardest things for me every time I try and do figures, to have them sort of general enough that they're kind of every man, but specific enough that they're convincing. Um, and then sort of to the, as you go along to the left of um, Freud, <laughs> you know, it kind of breaks down again, but it's, you know, things that I basically play with a lot of like the push and pull of between figuration and abstraction of figures, a lot of suggested figures, almost like sirens. Um, I've also been thinking and painting sirens and Hylas and the nymphs a lot. And thinking about that whole idea of the female sort of the evil from Eve to the nymphs to the sirens always how it's the woman's fault you know she's muse but and siren but also going to bring disaster on us all so there's this sort of ironic you know these these nymphs I've been working on who are sort of seducing Hylas but they're going to kill him. And so um, there's something of that on this on this left-hand panel where the palette and so on is. Yes, I wonder so that if, is, um, I was thinking a lot about um, Gauguin, in fact, because, you know, once I started thinking about the painters themselves and who you would have been hanging out with, and but um, Gauguin is a painter whose work I've always loved um, until fairly recently. Um, I just couldn't stop thinking about him in Tahiti and, um, because I've been thinking about these nymphs and sirens and nymphs are obviously underage. I just kind of like the idea of having the revenge of the nymphs. So it never, you can't read it in a literal way at all. So that I haven't, I've been, I've been unsure about how far to go into talking about this, but that was the impetus. And in the study, this, the palette is kind of clearer. So I was thinking of Gauguin's phallic thumb sticking up through that palette. But it also kind of feels like a baguette, um, which refers again to the Dejeuner sur l'herbe as this baguette sticking up from the basket where, you know, I mean, the Manet is so full of weighted with different psychological symbols from, you know, as are most paintings, good painting. But so, you know, the Gauguin, um, you know, I want there to be a, a humor to it as well. I mean, thinking of Thomas Rowlandson, who, you know, in a way I would have loved to, one of my first ideas was to respond to that in quite a direct way, but I didn't end up, but, you know, I love him and I love the, the idea of being a bit satirical and, um, you know, so I sort of thought it was quite funny to have Gauguin um, <laughs> beset by nymphs, you know, at first he might have thought it was fun, but it didn't end up that way. And then, you know, on the very left, there's another, the kneeling figure sort of refers back to, I mean, young Spartans and, but, you know, as I work, um, my own work has, comes into, becomes a reference just as much as other people's in a way. So, you know, there's a kneeling figure that I've used a lot. So she's a kind of hybrid um, of different figures. And again, without necessarily referring directly to things as I paint, but as a kind of memory of various different figures. And again, it's used quite as a formal device, the way that she kneel, her knees kind of weigh down the opposite corner too. So I think I was quite aware of, because of the format of having to, you know, have it tough formally that it didn't just all kind of slip off the edges. Can I ask you about the very striking title that you've given to this picture? So Unmoored from Her Reflection, which uh, I know because we've talked was taken from 
a uh, piece of writing written by my colleague in the gallery, Rachel Sloan, one of my curatorial colleagues, who used that phrase when she was writing on Manet's bar at the Folie Bergère. And I think it, it particularly resonated with you. Yeah, I mean, just, she wrote so wonderfully on that painting, which is one of the ones I was looking at a lot. Um, but, and she wrote of how, um, you know, the the woman in Bar at the Folie Bergère painting, she's, you know, there she stands. One thing I hadn't realized was that a barmaid in those days would have been um, probably a prostitute also. So there's this, um, the way that she's standing waiting, like so many female nudes sort of seem like they're waiting really, or a standing nude. I mean, we often just ask, what are they actually doing? But anyway, she's not nude, but she there she waits, but that she's in a way seems psychologically not necessarily that present. And that in fact, her reflection makes no sense, no physical sense. It's not where it should be. So I kind of like that idea that she was, you know, her inner self, which is in fact her, her in the reflection isn't at all present that she's just kind of this hollow fat female shell while her reflection is actually where her thoughts are. And I mean, that's very literal, but I loved, I hadn't ever noticed that the reflection doesn't actually make sense, but it's such a big part of why well, that it's got that slight, you know, unreality. Um, and the phrase just, I just, you know, immediately underlined the phrase because I think the idea also of unmoored um, is a way that something you could use to describe a lot of my paintings where, you know, and it's not so much that they're fully abstract, but they're not really grounded. Things are not where they should be and things are in the process of sort of breaking down or, um, and even when I do try and paint a figure, it tends to get unmoored and things drift. You know, they're slippery. It's, I can't, um, so I just thought it was such a terrific phrase. And then the fact that I had slipped my reflect, um, it all just seemed to fit quite neatly. Um, and at one point I was gonna call it unmoored from their reflection, um, not just to be fashionable, but thinking maybe it should be more about the nudes that it's from there or that it leaves it more open and ambiguous that it, um, but then at the end, I went back to her. Um, I want to- No, time's already marching on, isn't it's it? Unbelievable, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, I want to leave some time for people to ask questions. I'm just gonna ask you one last thing. I'm gonna stop sharing, which is just about you, you sort of completing the work really, or completing any of your works. I mean, any of us that have stood in front of them know how, sort of on the move they are, your pictures all the time, they seem to be on the move. I think you've you've said about the way that you hope your paint somehow traps energy. And I imagine that's how they feel to paint as well. I sort of imagine you on the move the whole time. And how do you then bring that to a, a conclusion? Is that very, was that very obvious in the process of painting this work when you could work no longer on it? Or was that a painful sort of uh, decision to, to down tools? Um, no, I mean, I always leave things alone for a while. There's never a moment of where I feel like I'm putting the last stroke on. Um, and I often get to the point where I feel that it's very close, but not quite. So that's usually when I tend to walk away, turn it to the wall for a few days or weeks. And then often when you pull it back out, it's obvious either what it needs or that maybe it is done. Um, and I often take photographs on my phone at the end of the day and I'll look at it in the evening and you can kind of judge it more clearly when it's small and see what's working and what isn't. Um, so I knew when it was close, but in a way that's the hardest moment because you don't want to get precious because you want to really keep all that energy up in the air. And the minute, you know, you st I don't want, never want to start sort of fiddling. Um, can I say there was a, you know, a backup I'd started, uh, ah. I got a second because I never just do one painting. Right. So you gave me the three canvases and I said, well, I will need six so that we, I can not get stage fright and mess it up. So, and the other is now three camp, three separate paintings, none of two of which are not working. One is, you know, they're still plowing away. So it's kind of a trick because they would have in fact never have been ready in time, but it's just mentally so that when I started the one that is in the Courtauld, I knew that 
I want to go into it, you know, being able to risk everything so that I can paint in my usual way as if it's not for anything in specific, for anything specific and still mess it up. Um, Cause I don't, you know, I wanted to keep that freedom. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, there's not, I think it's, it, I usually decide over a few weeks whether something's done. Mm. Well, this seems like a perfect moment to turn to Leila and ask her to uh, pose some of the questions from our uh, from our audience who are joining us this evening and who have sent in questions as well. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so we probably have about 15 minutes to run through all the many, many questions we have. Um, we might not have time for everyone, so sorry in advance. And I wanted to ask first one of our students' questions, which is actually, you've touched on this a lot, but they were asking how unusual it is for you to include a self-portrait in your work, Cecily. Uh, I've never done it before. Amazing. Yeah. That's really interesting. And I yeah, think when I was a student, I think painting a self-portrait from life is probably the very hardest thing you can possibly do. And having tried it quite a lot when I was young, I sort of, you know, vowed never to do it again because it's such torture. But um, so to do a sort of sketchy, uh, self-portrait yeah but no I've never never done it before wow that makes it even more special then um, and that, the same student has asked um, about the fact that you've recently worked with a number of unusual formats and settings so I'm thinking the Met and yeah. Core Claude are two examples and is this something you, you are especially interested in doing again in the future because it opens mm -hmm. unexpected possibilities and scales to your work I mean, I would like to do it sometime, but for the moment, um, I'm happy to sort of go back to painting the way I've always, not, I mean, yeah, I've always liked not painting for a show, for example, and I, 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 I'm I, gonna stick to that. But um, I don't know, I did a mural last year and I would definitely want to do another mural in, in America. Um, and that has to be planned a certain amount in advance, but, um, I think I'm, I had a very disrupted year, like a lot of people, and I really want to sort of just close the door and do whatever um, without, you know, I think it's been really, really uh, um, something I'd never thought I'd do would be to paint, do some, a commission. Um, but this was a very special situation. It's not something I really want to get into. Great, thank you. Um, and I guess that leads on to a question about whether you've actually seen the work in situ yet, or if you've just seen photographs. No, I haven't. Um, I haven't, but I'm getting used to that. It would be the third thing I'd never got to see in person, but I will get to see it. The fact that it's up for longer, I'm absolutely gonna come and see it in person. Um, yes, we definitely should and experience yeah. it amongst- No, I mean, I'm coming yeah. as soon as I can. Again, it's just, I have a kid, COVID, lockdowns, it's much harder to, as everyone knows. Um, so I'm desperate to see it, but when I was supposed to come, that didn't work out. So it's, it's gonna happen hopefully in the early this year. Well, we can't wait to welcome you, that's for sure. And I'm, I'm sure the students that have fed in their questions will be really excited to know that. Um, another question that has come up quite a lot in the chat as well as from the students is about what medium you use and why you are so drawn to using oil paint in particular, what is it about that that um, entices you? Um, I like the uh, um, I like the way oil paint moves, um, which I've never found. I know acrylics these days. See, when I was in school, acrylic was horrible. Um, so when I tried it back then, I really hated it, and I still I don't like the fast drying of it. Um, but I know now there are really great mediums you can add to it that make it very different from 30 years ago. Um, and I do like watercolor and gouache and pastel and inks and, um, but for paint paint, I just like the body of oil paint. I like moving it around. And um, I guess I kind of like the, it feels like you're living dangerously. Um, I'm so not a daredevil in any other area of my life. Um, that I think, you know, do you feel like you're living on the edge? Cause you can really lose something and not get it back with oil. Um, you know, one swipe and it's actually really gone. Um, 
I also like the slowness of it in a way, because I always work on a lot of things at once, which again, just stops me getting overly precious with one thing. And it keeps me in the zone that I like of being very free and loose. Um, so oil paint, a lot, because you can't really work on something two or three days in a row, um, you're forced to put it away. And that's really, really helpful for me. Um, I much prefer starting paintings to finishing them. So I do have a tendency to keep starting new ones and just, you know, I've, got, I've always got a lot of unresolved paintings around, but I think that's a good way to work too, if you've, if you have the space. It's amazing, yeah. And Layla, do you mind if I just ask something that I, I've seen flash up in the chat and I meant to ask, I've just seen it flash up, which is one of the things when you do come over, Cecily, that I hope you'll be super interested to see is a very large scale picture by Oscar Kokoschka that we have on display at the moment which is um, not a picture that I think you probably know. I mean, you, I, I think I probably sent you an image of it ages ago, but it's not something you've responded to, but there is a real synergy, I think, between him at that moment in 1950 and, uh, and your work, which people have commented on. Is he an artist that interests you and has been somebody in your mind at any point? Um, no, not that much, really. I think, um... I think I'm almost always attracted to people who I think are far away from me sort of stylistically. So I, I can really see the similarities, but I tend to sort of, you know, want what I am not like Manet, you know, like crave being able to be, so, you know, not to flatter myself that I'm like, but you know, there's a similar all over painterly, um, you know, so he's he's someone I think I avoided rather than really looked at when I was young. So I'm dying to see the one now because, um, you know, I think one's more tolerant as one gets older. Um, I think when I was young, I'd sort of run a mile from anything that anyone said, oh, you must look at Kokoschka. Um, but I would people would tell me that a lot when I was at art school, but I never really, I found it too, um, too, too um, active. <laughs> which is what my own problem with my own work too. But. That's fascinating. I can't wait for you to see them. Yeah. As but I love, it looked great in the reproduction. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, and also someone's asking, Cecily, if you could tell us about the painting that's behind you with the nudes. I um, think they're male nudes. Sorry. As... No, I can't. You know, <laughs> oh, okay. I'm supposed to be able to see it, but we <laughs> hide it. That's absolutely. Um, <laughs> no, I actually can't tell you about that right now. Oh, a little teaser then there for everyone. Um, another question that I think is... So I, can, I can tell you, it's going to be hopefully in a show in Munich this summer, but I'm still working on it. Um, got a show at the Pinakoteca in Munich. Um, and it, and yeah, but um, it's still very much in progress, but it's, uh, it's, it's after the quarter, you know, one thing leads to another. So I'm really trying those, the, those bathers from the middle of the courtauld picture. You know, in a way, I felt like I'd finally managed to do two male figures who were sort of standing still. Um, so this is like the next thing I've been doing after that. Um, I can imagine it's really destabilizing talking about a picture that's in progress and in your head and so on. So I do understand why you don't want to talk now. Yeah, very, I'm very excited about it, but um, sorry. No problem. Um, some and I, I went off social media. Um, so I used to post a lot of pictures in progress and it would be really hard to resist something, posting something that I was really excited about. Um, but uh, yeah, it just gets you into trouble. You know, I'm, it's, then you get comments and it puts you off your flow, so. Yeah, no, that, that really makes sense to me. Um, someone is asking as well, if you think about your pictures in any way related to plays and performances, like theatrical staging, which is quite an interesting link when I think about the sheer momentous size of that in the court hall, and it does feel like it's the backing of a stage. So have you ever thought about your own work in that way? Um, yeah, I do sort of think of the painting as a, a place in which to, where the paint performs. Um, and on working on a large scale, it's very sort of performative for me too, like how physical it is, you know, you really feel like you've got to 
rise to the occasion and and often you know if I'm painting wet into wet you really kind of have to be there and stay there so you sort of feel like it's it is very much in the moment like a like a play or a dance um yeah so there are similarities for sure great um what are your favorite brushes um Cecily someone's asking for a recommendation um, actually, Cornelison's in London has some of my favourites. Um, I'm not going to remember the brand off the top of my head. Um, they're bristle and they're, you know, really quite large, substantial wooden handles. Sorry, I can't remember the brand, but they're really good Cornelison brushes. Unfortunately, I hate talking about brushes because I'm a really good vegetarian, except for my brushes. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so I do actually love sable brushes. Probably shouldn't use. No, I, I'm like that. I'm a vegetarian, and then sometimes I realize I've bought leather shoes or something. And I I'm mean, like, leather terrible. too. I cheat with leather, but I'm a lifelong vegetarian, so I kind of feel like little leather. But yeah, I'm the same. We're, we're fine. I think we're doing our part. <laughs> so I think we probably have about enough time for one or two more questions. And one of them is about whether you reference the original freeze in any way that Barney showed at the beginning. But I've always loved the format of a freeze-like figure, a freeze-like painting and freezes themselves have always been something that fascinate me, like a, a sort of parade of figures. So I, I glanced at it, but it's not my kind of cup of tea to work from something so classical, but, um, but I think I, I play with the kind of idea of a freeze a lot, um, you know, just figures in motion, whether it's Egyptian figures walking, you know, sort of, the way they're stacked or something like Mantegna. Um, I've always been obsessed with uh, Mantegna's Triumph of Caesar that's at Hampton Court. And that's, you know, just very much the sense of, you know, figures marching across. So I've always really enjoyed that motion um, that exists in the original, but I didn't work directly from it at all. Great. And Barney, do you want to ask and choose from one of the many questions, the last question we have time for? <laughs> I'm just having a quick uh I'm just having a quick look at that I oh yeah I, the, there was a question uh, and we didn't really touch on uh we didn't really touch on Cezanne although Cezanne is a big part of our collection somebody's asking about Cezanne's bathers which aren't a part of our collection but whether uh those male nudes in your mind have some connection to the bathers yeah I mean I don't think you can paint a bather or a naked Person, you know, standing figure without really thinking of Cezanne. And we've got such great ones in America. Um, and I had just recently been to Philadelphia where they've got a great, great female bathers. And also the Barnes has lots of small, amazing bathers. Um, so yes, definitely. I mean, one funny thing is that even though I always work from other art and always have, I've always sort of avoided impressionism and post-impressionism as almost a too recent, you know, because I was at school in the late eighties, but um, just too close and too, you know. And so this is actually the first time I've ever worked directly looking at, oh well, no, that's not true. I've worked from Degas, but like Cezanne, I always really avoided because it just seemed too obvious and too um, sort of what one was escaping from at art school in a way. Um, so it's actually, a real relief in a way to come and just say, I'm just gonna copy a Cezanne. It's, um, and I recently did a, some, all these, I did do a few um, direct copies of Cezanne bathers, um, small, um, that I hope to show at some point as well. But yeah, it was very liberating. Mm. Sort of felt like a taboo. Cecily, thank you so much for joining us and being so open to our questions and telling us so much about the picture. I think you've really sort of, yeah, you've really en enriched uh, the work for us even further. And I hope everyone will be able to go and see it when they're next in London, next at the Courtauld, including you, of course, and we can't wait to have you uh, over in London again. I did, just before we close, I did just want to acknowledge a couple of other um other people that have been involved in the project because uh and i'm sure cecily you'd you'd join me in this as well it was no uh 
I mean, it, it must have been very difficult to paint. It was uh, no mean feat hanging it and getting it all the logistics and everything else. And I just wanted to thank our own team at the Courtauld for that and uh, Cecily's gallery, Thomas Dane Gallery in London, whose team were absolutely fantastic, um, and Cecily's studio uh, in New York, who were completely brilliant as well. It was a, a real team effort to get the picture uh, to London and on the wall and, uh, yeah, looking so fantastic. And then I also just wanted to thank uh, the Garcia Family Foundation, who supported the Courtauld financially in being able to uh, to uh, mount this uh, extraordinary picture and bring it over from New York um, and have it for public enjoyment uh, with us in the Courtauld. So many, many thanks to them as well. But Cecily, thank you to you above all. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you all so much. I mean, it's such a huge honor. I really can't wait to be over there, um, hopefully very soon. But, you know, it's it's a huge honor. And thank you for thanking everyone. Amazing. Yeah, that's definitely all we've got time for now. So Ceci, we'll let you get back um, to whatever okay. you need to be doing. And everyone at home, thank you for joining us. It's been lovely to see so much engagement in the chat and everyone's putting in their thank yous and saying where they've zoomed in from. So it's really wonderful. Stay in touch with the Courtauld as well um, and check out everything else we've got on. But we will see everyone soon. Thank you again. Bye, Cecily. Thank you so much. Bye.